Welcome to the XR Producer Beginner Course by Yahoo. I'm Henry Kaiser, and in this ninth and final video, we're going to talk about how do you take your beginner skills and begin to understand where you need to go to take yourself to the next level. We'll go through a number of skills you can pick up, as well as some advanced technologies you may want to explore as you further down your XR career. Now, across this entire series so far, we've really been focused on your first project, a pure beginner coming into this with no pre-existing skills, never having open software, and hopefully up to this point, you've been just slowly walked up to being able to create your first beginner project, getting it hosted on Sketchfab, and then also doing some steps to optimize your project. So you might be able to host it on another platform such as Spark or Snap Studio. And then we also talked in the last episode about photogrammetry, that first somewhat advanced skill that you can then use to start creating your own 3D models from 2D photographs. In this episode, we're really gonna go deeper to talk about a lot of other skills you can pick up, and we're gonna point you to other tutorials that you may be able to follow in order to pick up those skills. Over the course of this training program, we've used a group project to hopefully bring you step-by-step step through the entire arc of what you needed to know in order to do your first exercises. As you did this, you were hopefully also applying some of what you learned to your own project, but let's recap what we did over the course of this series. First, we started with planning. That really comes down to thinking, what is my story and what is the XR slice that's going to go with that story to both enhance the overall coverage and give our users something to explore. We talked about with the Mars Rover that the two stories we're really focused on were where it landed and a potential side story around the team and what instruments that team may have uh, contributed to the rover mission itself. And then we drew our mock-up images so that we could collaborate with a team around a shared vision and have it documented so that maybe if we had to revisit those uh, documentations later, we would know how to look at what our plan was and resume work from where we left off. After that, it was time to go find the assets that we needed for our project. We went and we searched various stores. For our training, we really focused on Sketchfab, but we mentioned there's a lot of other ones you can use for future productions. We then downloaded those assets from those stores and began to compile that 3D scene in Blender, positioning, rotating, and scaling our various components relative to each other with an eye in mind for how is our user going to be placed into this scene so that they can explore it and really get a sense of the story we're trying to communicate more viscerally right there in front of them. We then added contextualizing elements like title cards, cutouts of people, and also just images applied to planes to kind of round out the scene from things that we couldn't get 3D models for and also tell our story, uh, not just in the experience design of the 3D assets, but also then with text. And also we would usually add audio to a production as well that can help provide a voice to the subject of the story and also nudge users to understand where they might want to position themselves, what areas of the 3D scene they may want to look at. You can learn more about those, of course, as you just pick up how do I produce some audio uh, via voice recorder into your phone uh, or doing a regular audio production. From there, of course, we then need to prepare it to publish on one of our 3D platforms. We went with Sketchfab this time, uh, and in that case, we went ahead and we exported, made sure we fit into the constraints of a GLTF format. And then as we wanted to prepare it for other platforms, we needed to optimize our file a little further. So we decimated our 3D scene, and we also potentially uh, improved the texture images by resizing them and compressing them into a smaller file size file format. After we did all those things, we went ahead and we got it published on Sketchfab so we could get an embed code generated. We could then bring that embed code into our article pages, craft a nice headline, craft some terms in our article that help prime the user to go ahead and interact with something that's 3D in their page, potentially launching it into augmented reality as they scroll through the story. And also we then took our 3D scene, created some 2D videos that we can help use to put videos into our article, priming users to understand what it is they're about to interact with, also put those videos on social media. And if we're really ambitious, we talked about how we might be able to then take some of the 3D that we've created in Blender for Sketchfab initially and have it optimized to the point you may be able to host it on a social media AR platform such as Spark for Facebook and Instagram 
or Snap Studio for Snapchat. All of those things together provides us that holistic mission of going from the story, how do we want to tell that story, where does XR fit into that coverage, and how to get that executed and put out into the world so that your audience can really engage with your vision of how this story can be better explored. So assuming our package is now out the door, let's go back to Laura and find out what her reactions are and what she thinks in a longer form version of this uh, production, what we might've been able to accomplish with more time, more resources, and more skills. All right, Laura, so that one's done. Um, awesome. I'm really excited we got this out the door so fast. Yeah, I was, I was sad about the photogrammetry. You know, that takes a lot of time and a lot of work. And this was really about speed and about adding to the story. So I don't lose sleep over that. I think it's just great yeah. to be thinking about these things for the longer term. Yeah, I mean, and also it's a new technology. So sometimes even with all the time, sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. Uh, but... Parametry, even sometimes you think you get a great capture and there's a lot of work that goes into cleanup. So you really got to be prepared for that. Totally. Um, you know, with this one done, um, what do you think we do next with it? Um, is it is something, if, if we had more time for it, because this was only a day, you know, what, what more do you think we could be doing with it? Yeah, I mean, I think generally it's like, how much time can we give ourselves before these projects? How long in advance do we know that something like this is going to happen and be able to plan, um, you know, to, to get something out the door for that day, but have three months to work on it and be able to think about, could you contact JPL and go up there and do some of those ideas that we were talking about with Volumetric? I think going forward, we have a great starting point. You know, this is not the last Mars story that uh, we're going to be covering. So I would say just not letting it just sit there, thinking about, you know, when's the next story coming down the line? Um, it's great that we have this and can drop it in to anything that is, you know, coming up about Mars, but how does it relate to other stories that are happening in the space um, world right now? Uh, what are, what's the next thing going to be? Because I think, right, this, this rover is there. So what information are we going to get back from it? What's NASA going to be reporting on? And obviously we can't predict that. That's the point of the rover being there, but we know that we can expect that that information is going to come. And so can we do something with it like say you know when they found water could we show um you know what that actually means in a more detailed way or do some uh you know data visualizations around the information that we got from the last rover compared to this rover uh, that kind of thing i think those are all great stories i think we should absolutely lean into those um are there anything that's more xr rich that we could do with this one where it's you know um, my brain usually goes straight to animation, but maybe that's not the end of it. Are there other XR skills we could be applying to a bigger production from here? Yeah, I mean, I think I even said, like, can we watch it crawl along the ground, even though I know that what we did today is just a static piece. But yeah, I think animation would be a great thing. I think being able to, like, open up and see inside the rover, like, what is the control panel look like and be able to have that come to life in some way would be really cool. Um, even something kind of, I know it's a little out there, but you know me, um, but thinking about what would this look like behind like an artist's rendering of Mars or have somebody who's really like an incredible tilt brush artist draw the Mars landscape in 3D and then put this um, rover on it, you know, or even have somebody draw a version of the rover itself. Like we have the real 3D model, but you know, we know a little bit more than we're able to see. So could we have somebody um, mm -hmm. you know, who's really good at rendering something in VR in like a tilt brush or a quill and then translate that into AR, I think could be really neat. You had a great note during our photogrammetry one where you said like, can we volumetrically capture the scientists who are actually like working on it? And, you know, we could maybe then, uh, we talked about photogrammetry at the time, which is kind of a 3D still, but we could try to use volumetric capture cameras or bring them to a capture stage to do actually a hologram version of them. That's like 3D and alive and is actually like moving around the, the rover. Yeah, you got me thinking also about like, there's something very poetic about space and could you have, you know, a music background or an author reading a poem that was inspired by, by Mars and by, you know, this amazing exploration? Could you take it and make it a little bit more of an artistic piece and, and share it in different types of stories that you do in, in that way? 
And one of the uh, your one of your first pitches was about showing with the, the where the rover is like drove driven along its path. I think the rover's got a microphone on board. We could try to show it at various positions over its mission and like what was the sound that it captured at each of those positions. No, I really like that a lot. Yeah, and even if there's a way to show, you know, the sound might not that be be that different. I don't I don't know. I haven't listened to it, but you know, even if the volume of it is different, like at high and low points along its journey, being able to sort of track that in some way could be interesting. We never even touched on the Ingenuity uh, helicopter that's on board, and that, of course, will have the sound of it doing its little takeoff and landing, presumably. Cool. Um, I think there's a lot for us to work with as far as, like, what can we do that's more advanced XR from what we've just done in the last few hours. Um, and, and that's, of course, like, what we usually do is we build the fast one so we can get on the new cycle, and then we make it better from there. And then hopefully we know our story a few months in advance, so we actually make the best version the first version, but that's not usually how the stories break. No, but that's not true for any type of technology and news or any type of news story. You got to build on it. So yep. I think that's what we're doing here. News is inherently an agile way of working. The living thing, as are these immersive projects. And I think that's really important to remember. Yep. Hey, thanks so, thanks so much for your help on this project. Oh, of course. This was so much fun. It's great to talk to you. So Laura gave us a lot of potential things we might be able to do with a more expanded XR operation going forward. Let's talk about those one at a time. So for this entire program, we really focused on using 3D models other people had created. We touched on using photogrammetry to create some of our own, but of course, most people in the 3D industry may be 3D artists, and in those cases, they're oftentimes creating their own assets. So as you go forward in your XR career, it's very likely you're gonna to wanna to pick up some 3D modeling and 3D sculpting skills. While those terms may seem fairly different, they're both attacking the same problem from sort of just two different approaches. Modeling is often considered more of an approach around how do I position cubes and cylinders and spheres relative to each other and then begin to kind of bevel or uh, adapt them just in slight movements in order to form out of shape. Whereas sculpting sounds more like, of course, what it's taking inspiration from, starting with a larger shape with already a lot of detail applied to it and then kind of etching out of it and bending and bulging out of that general form like a lump of clay the overall object you're trying to form. Sculpting is sometimes used more for character design, face design, um, organic shape design, and then modeling might be used more for um, architectural design or just the design of maybe furniture items or complex uh, mechanical shapes. As you pick up, as you're interested in these skills, I really love to appoint people to two different sources, the beginner modeling course by Andrew Price, as well as the Blender uh, Fundamentals course, uh, which covers 3D sculpting. You can check out those both here and in the uh, description of the links below. Once you've started to pick up a bit of the 3D modeling and 3D sculpting skills, one of the very next things people begin to really become interested in are how do you make proper 3D characters? 3D characters may seem like they're just another type of 3D model, but oftentimes then you need to start thinking about how do I put bones into my characters so that they're not just static in a single pose, but they're designed to be moved, bent, animated to run, animated to interact in a variety of poses. Because of that uh, inclusion of now what we call armatures and rigged you know, skeletons and bones, uh, 3D characters are often more difficult for beginners to work with, and they're a bit more of a novice intermediary uh, level skill set to engage with those. So as you go to stores, if you start thinking, oh, I want to download these 3D characters into my scene, I mean, be, they may not be called that, but maybe you just you wanted a fireman and you found a fireman 3D model and you downloaded it in. You may find this has a lot of icons on screen that I don't currently recognize and it seems very difficult to work with. Maybe when I tried to move it from one position to another, it started to kind of stretch and skew in different ways. That's because that 3D character is running on a 3D skeleton, armature, bones, and a rig. These are all kind of this, the key terms you may need to know around that front. To get to know more about how to work with 3D characters, I'd encourage you to take a look at the uh, Blender uh, character rigging tutorial, which talks to you about once you've made a character, how do you put a rig, which is you know the, the shorthand to say a skeleton of bones and an armature into a 3D character. That additive process of showing how they're set up might help you understand a bit about how to work with them going forward. Additionally, when it then comes to 
how do I now take a character and pose it into a new shape? And then also how do I maybe potentially sort of animate it to do a new set of movements? This tutorial, uh, the basics of animation, which includes bones and, arm and armature, is a really great one that you can pick up and start to learn more about, not just on a character model, but in general, how do bones work as a form of animating within Blender? So I encourage you guys to check out these two when you're coming uh, to the time that you're trying to learn more about uh, character models and bones. Related, of course, then to character models and bones, we've already talked about how you might animate those characters, but that is already a more advanced form of animating than most beginners start to pick up as the next step on their journey. One of the most simple forms of animating that we use commonly in XR and really commonly on things like Sketchfab or your first sets of projects are what may be called transform animations, keyframe animations, and those are all controlled on that timeline that we kind of told you to ignore in the uh, fourth lesson on uh, Blender 101. So to learn more about how do you take an object and not give it bones and have it reshape itself, but fundamentally, how do I take an object and have it move from this part of my 3D scene to that part of my 3D scene over a matter of seconds? How do I get them to just kind of move around, rotate, get bigger, get smaller? Um, that level of animating, which we generally just call transform animating, you can learn more about that in the Blender Fundamentals video on the timeline. That will walk you through how do you take just a simple sphere and kind of animate it in the general arc of it falling, seemingly striking the floor, bouncing up a little bit and coming back down. For that tutorial, they're not going to be using anything like real physics calculations. It's just a really excellent first step example on how you might start to animate something within your project. Additionally, as we talked about, there's then character animation, a more advanced form of animating, because now you're not just moving the entirety of an object over a series of moments. You're moving small sub components of an object, the bones that are inside of a 3D object and each one may be moving independently. A bone may then also, you know, if I move my shoulder, it may also move the entire arm. So there's a relationship between those pieces that are all taking place. To learn more about character animation, I would encourage you to check out this tutorial for beginners, which can really help kind of just pick you up with not needing to know how do you apply all of your bones necessarily, how do you put them all into place, but understanding how do I get them to all move together and to get them to take a more complex series of steps and my character feels more alive and it seems to actually you know, flow and move within the space. This is a great tutorial for beginners on that front. Now, if character animating seems really daunting because it can be to understand how do I keep track of what's happening inside of every single little bone, one other technique you may need to start taking into account is motion capture. Motion capture is a technique then for watching the human body, generally via video or a camera lens of some sort, recording all the movements that the human body is detected taking place, and then software understanding, okay, what all bones in this 3D character should move then accordingly and automatically applying all of those changes to the bones. It's generally a bit more complex to set up if you're trying to put an entire hardware and software pipeline together yourself. Although the tutorial on the right, which talks about how do you, can you connect a Microsoft Connect camera to uh, some software that then eventually use that Kinect camera to record yourself performing and applying those performances into your Blender space is one potential route that you can go. Instead, there is also platforms out there nowadays that allow you to take a video of yourself and then that platform will deconstruct what it sees happening in the video and apply that to a set of character animations that you can then upload your character to the platform have the platform automatically apply those animations to the character and then download that character back with all the animations already set up. Or you could just download the animations out from that platform and then need to apply that animation to the character rig that you currently have in your character in Blender. That may seem daunting, but for a lot of beginners, I do encourage them to, as they've started to feel a little comfortable understanding at least the basics of how the skeleton and the armature system work in a character model, they might want to check out Deep Motion to get to understand more about how they can now uh, just take some selfie videos of themselves performing and use those videos to instantly animate their characters without needing to have any more complex sensors or hardware pipelines beyond already using Blender, 
already using a smartphone and setting up another free account with the new service. Setting aside characters for a moment, let's talk about one of the other really effective things that you can do within XR, and that is making data feel more visceral to a user. Data visualization in 3D is something that's been around for a long time, but data visualization in XR is still incredibly new. It's something where you're gonna find a lot of designers out there who are publishing papers around what works, but they assume you already know how to do some forms of data visualization within your 3D engine on the road to getting to their now expanded uh, user experience designs that they're speaking about. This video on the left is by Chris Prem, who's a data scientist and also a really effective creative technologist. We'll show you how to take Excel data or CSV data files and begin to automatically interpret 3D shapes and 3D visualizations within Blender. It does involve a little bit of setting up scripting within Blender. I understand that code is not something a lot of us as content creators got into this space in order to write, but it should be fairly accessible and he does a great job slowly walking through how you set that up so that you can then apply a data set and see Blender automatically create the shapes at all the correct scales, locations, and rotations. From there, of course, you just have to take your mind's eye and some of those visuals you may find online to figure out how do I redesign this, not just to be a chart now within Blender, but to become more of an experience that my users are going to stand in the middle of. Equally, there is the new platform out there called Virtualytics. Virtualytics is a virtual reality data visualization platform. You can use this one instead of Blender, of course, to put in data visualization files, be that CSV, Excel, and then find ways of crafting that. And this platform is designed then for headset-born users or potentially augmented reality glasses-born users to not just stand within that space, but also interact with it in XR. You can find out more about these by watching these videos that are here and linked below. While graphs and charts are great, there are a lot of other things that you may uh, want to quickly, almost automatically adapt 3D models for. Uh, two forms that I find myself using repeatedly and commonly are how do I adapt 3D maps and how do I adapt uh, 3D, or I'm gonna restart that section over. Two seemingly simpler forms of data visualization that are a lot more accessible than starting out with changing scripting in order to uh, automatically assemble really complex three-dimensional charts are just how do I automatically generate 3D maps and how might I automatically generate 3D uh, architecture renderings of a building or so forth. So I really like to point people to the OpenStreetMaps add-on for Blender which allows you to select an area of a region on a, a map that will load in someone's browser, copy the coordinates of the area that you're interested in directly into your Blender software uh, using a free add-on. And then that add-on will uh, call back to the OpenStreetMaps database, which has a you know, map of most of the entire world that's been contributed to by uh, creators like you around the world that will automatically create three models of all the streets, uh, various markers for where are their parks and waterways, as well as 3D buildings. We can really give your city a uh, distinct uh, feel in 3D because you can now see the height of things. You can place yourself midway through street level. You can rotate around the whole city and tell a story about a city that's evolving over time photographic stories of places around a city. There's a lot you might be able to do by being able to very quickly render out a 3D environment uh, that could be urban or could just be kind of showing a large region um, and maybe where are the highways or where are the waterways around that region. So I really encourage you to check out this video that'll help walk you through setting up open street maps and giving yourself a short 15 minute project you can set up. On the right, however, you can learn more about how do you actually create a 3D house really quickly and accessibly uh, designed with VR in mind. So in this case, it's not just about how do I set it up in 3D software, but it has that lens towards putting someone inside of that home. And so I really encourage you to check out this tutorial and learn more about how you might be able to do that by Jim Van Hansen Duck. Once you're finding that you're starting to reach the edge of your ambitions within Sketchfab, it may become time to go to the next level and start thinking about game engines. Game engines are where a lot of the most advanced XR applications are built. Generally, there are two leading players in this space. It's the Unreal Engine and the Unity Engine. 
There are other engines that are out there from NVIDIA, from Amazon, from Microsoft, but these two constitute the largest part of what people are currently uh, using to make XR applications today. Now, I'm not gonna particularly endorse Unity or Unreal. They're both excellent for different things, and they also have large communities that can help support you, guide you, and a litany of tutorials that you can already reach out to to pick up uh, how to do all the various things you might need to know as you come into that. That said, getting into game engines is definitely once you've already reached an advanced skill level. Before you start trying to do that, you're gonna to wanna to be comfortable working with 3D models, composing 3D scenes, understanding how to work with your various uh, texture images and materials in order to build out those 3D objects, as well as you already wanna know a fair bit about animating and whatever else you might be trying to bring in. So if you're trying to bring in holograms, you're gonna to wanna to already feel comfortable with holograms. If you're bringing in rigged characters that have character animations, you're, want, you're going to want to feel comfortable with those parts before you're now in a game engine, which also brings on top of itself all the complexities of triggers, physics engines, colliders, and the scripting. And Because then you have to start picking up how do I script 3D objects directly impacting each other in real time based on things that the user is being uh, allowed to do. So uh, while I encourage people to go this route as they're ready to take on the most advanced forms of XR, I would say hold off for as long as possible while you go ahead and you fill up your toolbox with all the skills that you're gonna need before you take up that next step. Once you're working within game engines, then is also the time potentially to consider the holograms we've talked about since the very beginning of this course. Volumetric video, which is another form of uh, another term of art for how we usually create holograms, the idea of taking a lot of videos and making a character which is three dimensional from all those videos, is generally most commonly only going to be supported in those game engines. Most other platforms do not necessarily have a lot of support for volumetric video. Equally, volumetric video is a fairly advanced skill that is gonna require you to feel comfortable at that point, working with all the various softwares you're already working with, working with game engine software, setting up new plugins for those softwares, and then having some special equipment around in order to do the volumetric video capture. A really easy first step in volumetric video, and by easy, I mean easy for someone who's already advanced, the first step in creating volumetric video is often working with two and a half D volumetric uh, such as the Depth Kit capture system. Depth Kit uses your either Microsoft Connect, Microsoft Azure, Intel RealSense cameras, and then will those cameras which have both a regular RGB camera built into them, as well as a depth distance scanning camera, will scan a performer, will have the depth of that performance, so you'll be able to see the actual contour of that character, and you can then place that into your 3D game engine scene but as opposed to a full three-dimensional hologram, this is really a flat video, which is being curved around the shape of the character and performer. But if you were then to look at that uh, shape from the side, from behind, you'll find that the shape usually cuts off where the camera couldn't see. And of course, from behind, the character may look a little inverted as there's no uh, back on that character. You're not kind of looking into a forward-facing cavitation. It can still be used in a lot of great productions. There are award-winning uh, productions from Sundance, from Cannes, that have been really exceptionally produced using Depth Kit. It is a favorite of mine. My webcam is actually a Depth Kit scanning webcam. Uh, however, uh, there are if you're looking for that full, rich hologram, you're going to have to turn the corner and probably go to the capture stage. The Microsoft capture stages are the most popular capture stage technology uh, in the industry today. They are fairly uh, costly if you're just an indie producer, although you may be able to work out deals with them as well as work out, uh, you know, how do you use a grant to help pay for the cost of a volumetric production. Uh, but it's just to say that if you are a student of this craft and you're looking to just start doing volumetric, it may be outside of your price range still until you're working for a company or you have a large budget behind your production. But the volumetric capture stages are the top tier of hologram production in the industry today. In those cases, you'll go to an actual studio, which has an array of a few hundred uh, video cameras, 
and those video cameras will allow you to put a performer in the middle of that space, recording them from hundreds of cameras all at once and producing a full 3D uh, form of them that is live and is used to tell really rich stories in XR. So once you're ready to go the volumetric video format, definitely take your time and learn more about the options that are out there once you've reached that level of, of comfort. Um, depth kit is one that you can definitely do from home. It's a fairly accessible price point for someone who's getting started. I think it may still have a free tier if you're just getting the skills underneath you, which doesn't allow you to export, but to get to know, okay, I at least know what I'm doing now and I'm ready to start using this for real. And then there's usually a, a few tiers that are a few dollars a month that you can go ahead and get started for. And then of course, once you're ready to go for the big leagues, go ahead and take a check, uh, take a look at the Microsoft Capture stages um, when you're working on your next big production. So with all of those skills we've just laid out and all those other technologies you can explore as you proceed down your XR career, we hope that you understand now as a beginner, these are the first steps in a large potential industry that you can play a, a significant impact on. As opposed to video and article writing, audio, podcasts, the XR industry is still fairly young and not to say immature, but has a lot of room for people to come in a, a, be, and immediately have an impact because there's just not as many people who are contributing and you may find a great and solid niche and new career for yourself in this space. I hope that this tutorial has been able to walk you through a lot of what you've needed just to say, you know what, I can do this. This is not as frightening as it was previously. And as I begin to feel comfortable, I may find um, that this area of XR, maybe it's animating, maybe it's 3D sculpting, maybe it still just remains quick turn 3D storytelling. You wanna be someone who's a prolific XR storyteller, using it to tell the latest of what's happening in music, the latest of what's happening in games, the latest of what's happening in the news. Um, and this was now your first step at understanding this is something that you can do. For the last time, I hope you got a lot out of this series as we worked our way from idea through searching for the pieces that you needed, assembling them in 3D software, getting them published and improving them for later platforms, learning how you could 3D scan stuff and learning where you could go next. I also wanna say thank you, not just to you, but thank you to the people who helped make this possible. Thanks to Yahoo, thanks to the Online News Association and Journals in 360 for funding this project. And we really hope that this, this is something that you get a lot out of. You'll continue to share your work with us using Yahoo XR, hashtag Yahoo XR course. Your homework going forward is to go tell stories. Get them out there and show us what you're doing. This is a new industry and there may be something that you do that we learn a lot from just because we haven't seen what, what's in your head yet. And you may figure out some new techniques and some new layouts that no one else has actually done before. So once again, I'm Henry Kaiser. I thank you for going with us through this journey of learning what your start is in this XR landscape. We hope you have a really great career going forward, telling excellent XR stories. Hope this has been helpful. Please share with everyone who you think can uh, become a future collaborator and take care of yourself.